All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you all had a great break. Uh, up next, we're going to have Zainab Ali talking to us about uh, Dominion of Domains. Zainab's a functional polyglot. She organizes the London Scala Users Group, but is going to be talking to us today about a DSL for the deck building card game Dominion. So Zainab, I will turn it over to you. think that we can see. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, so let's get started. Um, so I'm Zainab. I'm a functional programmer. But as well as programming, I play board games. Now, whenever I play a particularly strategic board game, I always get a thought. It's a thought that all programmers secretly have when playing board games. And it goes like this. I should code this. <laughs> and when you think about it, that's not surprising at all. A board game is essentially a well-defined process, and a process is a program. Dominion, the board game, is a perfect example of this. It's a card game during which you compete with other players for the biggest kingdom, and you do so by playing cards. Now, each card has a program on it. And when you play a card, you realize as a programmer that you're just executing this program. And whenever we recognize a program, we want to code it. You might be wondering, how are these cards programs? Well, there are essentially sets of instructions that you follow, each of which change some part of the game state. For example, you might add two to your action count, or one to the number of things that you can buy. You might increase the amount of gold that you have. It might even be an instruction to move some cards around, or test that they satisfy a particular predicate. Okay, it's jam time. Imagine that you are in a game jam, and your challenge is to code up the program on this card. What code would you write? Well, it would probably look something like this. We would have a data model for a game which would encompass all the players and all the cards that they had. There'd be some IO for rendering and possibly user input. And this would all be in a monad transformer uh, state T because we do have something stateful. And this is a perfectly acceptable solution for a game jam. But now imagine that you're trying to design a game you expect to code up hundreds of these cards. Not only that, you expect to extend the game with new features and mechanics. You might release expansion packs, uh, which ch add a new card type or change the way that the point system works. And all the new cards that you add need to be compatible with all of the older ones. So this solution, while it's fine as an initial program, has problems with maintenance and extension. So when we're thinking about maintaining a solution, there are a couple of questions that we might want to ask. Firstly, how do we do less work? And secondly, how do we make sure that the work that we do do is correct? When making a game, as well as defining the program on a card, we also need to write its description and a much more detailed explanation in a rule book of what a card does. Is there some way that we can generate this? Now, some of these programs have preconditions. For example, I can't choose a card if there are no cards left for me to choose. How can we know what these preconditions are and so validate that a card is actually playable? We might accidentally introduce bugs in the game. While moving cards around, we might lose a card. How can we ensure that a bug can't destroy or create arbitrary cards? It's also important that we don't duplicate cards. When we add a new card, how can we ensure that it's unique? We can't do this with our current approach because there's no way of inspecting a monad transformer. Now, one thing that we can do is have some central representation of a program, something that interprets to a monad transformer for evaluation, but also interprets to a string, a description for printing, 
and perhaps a data type for quality checks. What might this representation look like? Well, to answer that, we need to think about how we compose this program. If we take a look at the card, we can see that it's composed of many smaller programs and each of these in turn are composed of expressions and we're also referring to some values there, some integer literals and some properties of the game. And if we look at a card in this way, we actually see a language. It's a very precise language specific to the domain of the card game and our representation is just the syntax of this language. Our interpreters are its semantics. So the problem that we're going to try and solve today, the thing that we're going to try and do, is to design a domain specific language. And we're going to embed this in Haskell such that we can interpret this into Haskell functions. We will only write two interpreters, an evaluator for this language, and also a printer to print out its description. The, the techniques we'll use can extend to all sorts of other interpreters. This might seem like an easy task, but the language in itself isn't so simple. There are variables, conditions, and recursion, and changes in context. We won't be able to design all of these features within the talk, but we will see a path towards them. Let's start by simplifying our problem. Instead of a language for cards, let's focus just on a language for integers in addition. We're familiar enough with this. How would we design it? We'd probably represent our uh, program, our syntax, as a data type, an expression tree with nodes for addition and uh, leaves for literals. Now an expression would just be an instance of this data type. If we wanted to interpret this, we would recurse over the tree. To evaluate it, we'd just recurse over it, adding all the nodes. To pretty print it, we'd recurse using string concatenation. And this encoding, where we encode using data types, is known as an initial encoding. It seems like a good solution, and it's very simple as one, but it does have some problems when it comes to extension. Let's say now that we want to extend this data type to support subtracting resources. We add a minus. Well, we might try just wrapping our initial expression in another data type, a minus x, and adding another clause to that, but we find that this doesn't work. We can't embed minus uh, type within the previous expression because it's recursive. Now there are ways of getting around this. Uh, we could, for example, encode our data type as fixed points and that would produce a very interesting structure. But instead, what we're going to try and do is explore a different approach. We're going to encode our data type as a type class. Our, and our interpreters are just going to be instances of that type class. So let's take a look at the language that this might have. Um, the functions on this type class just correspond to the predicates, uh, or sorry, the primitives of our previous data type. Um, and an expression is uh, simply this representation type. Now let's try and extend this language to support minus. Um, we find that all we need to do is just write another type class to represent our new minus syntax. And we can combine that with our previous type class for integers uh, to just write our syntax for expressions. Now that seems all well and good, but how do we actually write interpreters for this? Well, if our type class itself is representing the syntax of our language, it has no meaning, then an interpreter is an instance of that type class. It provides meaning. In this case, our interpreter is simply something that evaluates to an integer. It adds our numbers together. And the actual interpreter, our evaluation, is simply an identity function. 
Now let's say that we wanted to write another interpreter for this language. We wanted to pretty print it. Our, we'd simply write another type class instance. And our pretty printer also would be an identity function, which would collapse this representation onto the data type that that instance represents. Okay, so we've seen how we can extend our syntax uh, using final encoding. But how can we actually use this technique as a whole uh, to model our language? Well, we've already modeled a language for integers. Now what we need to do is model a language for actions, buy and gold. In other words, a language for resources. And for that, we can just create another type class. And we might think as a start uh, that to compose expressions in this language, we just combine these two type classes. Action plus lint2 seems like it might be a valid expression. But how would we actually evaluate this? So as we said before, our evaluator is a Mona transformer. Um, but if we were to try and instantiate this thing into a Mona transformer of unit, try and write an instance for this, we find that we can't actually write something that makes any sense. And in fact, there are worse problems here. We can represent some invalid expressions using this syntax. For example, what would you do if you had a card which simply had the, uh, the phrase lit one on it? How would you interpret that? What about gold plus gold? How would you change your game state if you had that card? So we have a specific idea of what a valid modification actually is. It's a resource paired with a function that modifies it. And all of these aren't valid modifications. So if we can express things in our language which aren't actually valid, then that means that we need to enforce some constraints on the forms that we can express. Now in Haskell, we're very good at this. We do it using types. Now, if a program needs to be made of a resource, such as action, and a function that modifies it, if action has some type uh, which resolves to an integer, then that, res uh, that function needs to also be of type int to int. And that means that literals are of type integer. But what about this action type? Well, we did say that it does need to resolve to an integer. We need to be able to get the value of it, but we also need to set its value. In other words, our action should be something that allows us to get and set. And so for this, we can make use of optics. We can use a lens. Now, if you're not familiar with what lenses are, uh, you don't need to worry. For this talk, you can just think of them as getters and setters. So with these types, we can now write a modify function. Um, the definition of modify now includes another type parameter, which is the type, the result type of the expression. Now, notice that we can no longer compose these expressions using plus. Plus only operates on expressions of the same type. This is in some ways breaking composition, um, but in actual fact, it's breaking composition in a way we want because we want to enforce constraints. And now if we try and modify, for example, to write gold plus gold, this doesn't compile. We can also write evaluators for these. Uh, for example, our evaluator for int is just an int, um, which we then lift into this Mona transformer stack. And our evaluator for our resource language is just one that lifts a lens. It's our uh, higher language, our statement language, which does the actual work of resolving what these are and making a modification. And so now we can write a valid statement in this language. Um, we can say that in order to add two actions, for example, what we do is that we modify the action resource uh, with a plus two. And if we evaluate this using our evaluator, we get a state T, which we can run. Now that's all well and good, but a card is actually made of multiple of these statements. We need some way of combining them. 
And we could add a uh, combine another compose operation onto our statement language. But in fact, one of these already exists in your usual Haskell toolkit. It's called a semi group. So what we can do is that we can just use an existing Haskell type class and pull that into our language to compose these statements. So in total, if we want to write this card, we need to compose for, combine four languages together. We combine a resource language with an int language, a language for statements, and finally a semi group, and we're able to write this statement. Now this seems a bit verbose with all these type classes. And so what we might do is group all of them together into a single action language. Okay, so so far uh, we've looked at domain specific languages and we've seen how they apply to our problem. We've explored being able to encode these using data types and initial encoding. And in more depth, we've encoded them using type classes. We've also uh, looked at how we can extend a language using type classes by just combining it with other languages and how we can compose within a single language. We've also looked at how we can constrain our language with types and made use of some existing uh, type classes which are inside Haskell to do so. But all in all, the cards we've modeled have been very basic. In fact, we can only model one card in Dominion so far. So let's look at something more interesting. Um, so this workshop card says, gain a card costing up to four gold. And we can paraphrase this. Gain means to take a card from the central supply pile and move it into your own pile called the discard pile. So we can paraphrase this as pick a card that costs less than five from the supply pile and put it into your discard pile. Now pick here implies that there's some choice going on. Card less than five is a predicate. That means that we need to have a language for cards and a language for booleans. And we're talking about a supply pile and discard pile, so we need a language for those. Now this is what our syntax for our language might look like. We can model piles also using lenses of lists of cards, essentially that's what they are. And we can have a function, a predicate function, to operate on cards to check that they're a valid choice when we pick them. And we can also uh, have another term for put when we want to put a card into a pile. We also need uh, a lens for that pile. There are some other terms that we need as well. For example, a less than operation, we need to write a Boolean language for that. And we'd need to write, write languages for our, our resources, uh, our cards and piles. But before we proceed much further, uh, there's kind of a nagging thing, which is a little bit annoying about what we've been doing. Um, whenever we write an uh, interpreter for evaluation, we always need to lift this interpreter into a state T because that's what our, our language representation is. Um, and we're doing it for things which really don't feel particularly stateful. Now, in fact, if we go and we take a look at the language that we have to describe this card predicate, it feels like this should really just evaluate to a function. And if we look at it a bit more closely, what we can see is that actually its syntax is a little bit different to the language around it. Its terms are different, and it's almost as though it in itself is its own language. Is it possible to have a language within a language? Well, let's try and model this language of predicates. We'd need to have some way of referring to cards, uh, some language of booleans, and some language of integers, and that's really all it is. Um, if we want to evaluate this, we'd want to take it and turn it into a predicate. Uh, so our evaluation function would just be something that resolves uh, this language to card to bool. So if we wanted to have an expression of this language, uh, an expression would have a Boolean type at the end. It would, for example, be something like cost less than five to test that a card's cost was less than five. And 
really when we write these kinds of expressions, these kinds of terms, we're just talking about the syntax. We would like to decide what these mean when we embed them in our outer interpreter. Let's say that I'm writing uh, my interpreter uh, for my statement language and I'm writing an interpreter for evaluation. I would want this language to resolve into a function, a predicate. But if on the other hand, I was writing it for pretty printing, I would want a string representation of what this was. So in fact, what that means is that we want to pass the syntax in as an argument into our higher language. And we want to interpret that syntax when we interpret our higher language, our outer language. And we can do that. We can just have a argument to our function, which is this term. Uh, here I've called it card piece and so. So our pick function, instead of taking in a, a function, now takes a term in this embedded language. It also takes a reference to a pile and a card and returns a card. Now, one thing to note about this is that it does break composition. Uh, we are, in doing so, we are not able to compose any terms of our embedded language into our outer language. There is a clear barrier and a clear separation between these two. So we have to be quite careful when we decide to do this. We might decide to do this for piles as well. We might say that actually with piles, you can't compose them and construct them in our outer language. You have to just simply refer to a pile. Now, if we do this, our uh, instance of our interpreter becomes a lot more simple. Um, we just need to resolve our card predicate P into a function. And we can do that just by passing it into another Haskell function that accepts a function. And to resolve our uh, pile to a lens, we simply pass all that also into a function that accepts a lens. So now if we want to pick a card, we just need to find the pile filter the cards using the predicate, which we interpret as a function, ask the user to choose one of the selection, delete the original card and return this card that they have picked. And so using all those constructs, we can actually write this workshop card. Um, now here, cost less than lit4 is actually another language. Okay, so, so far, we're now fairly familiar with embedded DSLs and how we can write them using final tagless encoding, using type classes. We've been able to extend our language with other languages and compose expressions. But we also know that we can purposefully break this if we want to embed a language within another. We can also model a fair few cards within Dominion, but the language is actually much, much richer than uh, what we've taken a look at. And so before we finish, I want us to look at something a little more complex. Let's look at variables. Okay, so let's consider this card, the mine card. You may trash a treasure card from your hand and gain a treasure to your hand costing up to three more than it. And we can decompose this into a few statements. One is that, okay, we need to pick a treasure card from our hand. We can do that. We've written a statement for pick already. We need to pick another card that has the value of less than three plus the cost of the original card that we picked. And here's where it gets a bit tricky. We then need to put that card into our hand and put the first card into a trash pile, a different pile. Now, the most interesting part of this statement is that we are referring to a card that we picked up previously. In other words, we have a variable in here. How might we try and encode this? Well, let's first think about the challenges that we're going to have. Uh, our predicates, instead of just being a card to a Boolean value, now need to be able to take in multiple cards. We also need to enforce some constraints such that if a predicate does refer to a previous card, it can't simply be the first statement of, of, our, uh, of our language here. It needs to occur somewhere down the line so that we actually have previous cards to refer to. 
And we also need to somehow specify how many cards we have. So this seems like a difficult problem, um, and it is one, but luckily we can take inspiration from programming language design already to solve it. Uh, we can consider to have a stack of cards in flight. We can represent that through another type in our type class. Whenever we pick a card, we add to the stack. And whenever we pick a card, we remove it. Now within our predicate, we need to refer to these cards that are within this stack. And uh, we can do that uh, using a very basic type level encoding of numbers. So if we have a Z that implies zero, we're referring to the top card in our stack. And that's going to be the card that we're testing for this predicate. On the other hand, if we have a successor of Z, then that would be the previous card, this one. And so we can write interpreters, which are just functions, which go from this stack and take a card out of it. And an expression in this language is very similar to the one that we had originally. If we want to express that the card that we're testing costs less than the card that we've just picked up, it would be like this. We'd say cost Z is less than the cost of S Z plus some literal. And when we actually have our, uh, our movement language, now all we need to say is that a card uh, predicate um, needs to have a type, which is a card greater than the, uh, the thing that was passed in to our pick function, the stack we originally have. And so we can construct the mine card like this um, by picking a couple of cards and putting cards later. Now using this, we actually get some additional type safety um, because if we say that our card needs to have a stack which is empty, then that implies that all of the cards that we picked up have to have been put down somewhere. So an additional benefit of this kind of encoding is that we get out of it that we can't destroy cards. We've basically enforced that constraint. So there are a few other ways that we can go here. There are plenty of things that we haven't explored. Um, there are cards in Dominion which contain a lot of recursion. They have control flow. Um, you switch players, so you switch context. We've only covered a couple of interpreters, some very fairly simple ones. Um, there are other ones that we could experiment with, like contextual interpreters, if we wanted to actually print this description. And we also haven't really explored transformations where we take our language and transform it into another language. Now, if you're interested in this approach, uh, definitely check out the original works on type tagless final interpreters. Um, if you want to use them in more conventional ways, uh, then perhaps the MONA transformer library might be more applicable to you. And if you're just interested in EDSLs and Haskell, then check out the Haskell wiki. It's a great place to look. Thank you very much. <laughs>